Sorophaganax has often been considered the largest theropod in the Morrison Formation, this really big rock unit that extends as far south as Arizona and New Mexico, as far north as southern parts of Canada, and as far east as Oklahoma. And Oklahoma is really important here because that's where the Kenton I quarry is, where Sorophaganax was actually found. Sorophaganax's holotype has been through some tumultuous times, in part because it was first described as Sorophagus in the 1930s, but also not really published in an official journal, so it's just kind of a name that stuck with it until people realized that Sorophagus was actually used for a bird that already lives, and that name was used earlier as Sorophagus. And the modern day bird is the Great Kiskadi, which now is actually a different genus, but regardless, they couldn't use the name Sorophagus. So they changed it to Sorophaganax, so king of the lizard eaters instead of just lizard eater. From the 1930s, there was a little bit of back and forth on this material, until 1995 when the paleontologist Daniel Chur described three bones as the holotype of what he named Sorophaganax maximus. The holotype consists of only three bones all along the backbone, and there's some issues with each of them that I'm going to bring up, and some of them are a little bit more promising than others, but it's really important to take all of them as individual bones, rather than saying, oh, these must all be lumped together as the same animal. There's also a bunch of other bones that have all been found at the Kenton One Quarry that have been lumped together into Sorophaganax. Basically, any bone belonging to a large theropod in the quarry must be Sorophaganax, worry about the details later. And now people are starting to worry about those details. Now, Daniel Chur, when describing these three bones as Sorophaganax, did look at traits in those bones that are very different from the other theropods in the Morrison Formation. And he needed to be really careful about that because the Morrison Formation has a lot of different large theropods. For example, there is Allosaurus, two different species, Jim Madsoni and Allosaurus fragilis, as well as Torvosaurus, a large megalosaur, and even Ceratosaurus, which while often shown smaller is because the good fossil we have of it is much smaller, but we also have some fossils from it that are very comparable to the smaller Allosaurus species, Allosaurus jimadzani and Allosaurus fragilis, with Torvosaurus being the largest theropod that is definitely known from the formation, and Sorophaganax rivaling that. A lot of really similar theropods, including in the same genera, have also been found coming from parts of Portugal and Spain, meaning that these animals would have had a pretty wide range and seemingly did very well for themselves. And in addition, that makes sense because we know that there would have been a lot of sauropods and especially juvenile sauropods around. Sauropods, from what we can tell when they laid their eggs, they kind of just left a whole bunch of them and then left entirely. It's kind of like with sea turtles, where sea turtles lay a ton of eggs, but very few of them actually survive into adulthood. As for the bones themselves in the holotype, we can first look at a broken neural arch, and it has accessory laminae, which are these little structures up at the top of the bone that just help it to function as far as supporting the overall neural arch. This is something we know exists in some theropods and also in sauropods, so it's a Sariskian group trait. Really interestingly though, in the theropods that are known from the Morris information, they don't have that, so that makes sense. However, also, it might still just belong to a sauropod as it is pretty heavily damaged, so we're missing a lot of the traits that would really help to align it with the theropods. So it could be theropod or it could be sauropod. It's kind of up in the air. However, there are still more traits, for example, upturned diapophyses, which is something we don't see in very large adult mature sauropods, but we do see in theropods. However, we do see that same kind of trait in juvenile sauropods, just not the adults. So again, very much up in the air as to what this bone might be. There's also the atlas. The atlas is the vertebra that's the forward most in the neck. So essentially it's called the atlas because it holds up the entire head. You have one, I have one, your cat has one. Most vertebrates have exactly that. Fish are a little funny just because they're fish and they live in the water. They don't need quite that much ability to turn their head upwards the way we do. And just looking at the outline of these two bones, that atlas from Sorophaganax on the right and an Allosaurus atlas on the left, you can see these are distinctly very different bones, which is great. You can just, great, this, yeah, wonderful. We have different characteristics to diagnose Sorophaganax from Allosaurus. But then you put in Camarasaurus's atlas and um, yeah, you, you can kind of just see the problem. It's pretty clearly something more like Camarasaurus, a large sauropod's atlas. It's basically got nothing to do with the theropods. So this atlas really can't be used for Sorophaganax because it probably belongs to something that's already named and there's a lot of sauropods in the Morrison Formation. Maybe it is something new, we don't know yet, but doesn't seem like it belongs to a large theropod. 
And finally, there's some tail vertebrae that have all been assigned to Saurophaganax, and they're really distinct from Allosaurus because you can see they have this big meat cleaver-like shape is how it's been described a lot of the time. I would call it more of an axe head, but you get the idea. There's this big protrusion towards the bottom of it. And yeah, very distinct from Allosaurus. Here it is next to some vertebrae that have been described from the same quarry from an Apatosaurine, so something like Apatosaurus or Brontosaurus. Once again, that bone is not diagnostic as a theropod, or as to Saurophaganax. It also means there's more than one animal knocking about in the three bones that we've used to describe Saurophaganax, because at least one is a Camarasaurus, or similar, another is an Apatosaurus, or similar. So we have at least two animals here, maybe three, because that uh, first bone, again, just isn't diagnostic. We don't know what it is. All of this is just to say that, yeah, Saurophaganax, it's a nomen dubium, which is what we use when we can't use the name for that animal anymore. There's a couple of really good examples of this. For example, Trudontids, the, they're named after Trudon. Nobody really uses the name Trudon anymore, though, because it was named only from teeth. It's most likely that Trudon is actually Stenonychosaurus, which was named from teeth, but also some bits of jaw and other parts of the body. So we actually understand better what Stenonychosaurus is than Trudon. So people don't use Trudon anymore. Makes sense, and this is just applying it to other fossils, in this case, Saurophaganax, or rather, some sauropods. That said, I did mention that there's other material that's been assigned to Saurophaganax as just, oh, well, it's big theropod material from the quarry. Call it Saurophaganax. Might not be Saurophaganax, but is it actually a valid group that we can say is distinct from the other species in the Morrison Formation? Well, looking at some of it, we can say, yeah, at least some of this is, in part because there's some tail vertebrae that are very deeply concave, or hourglass-shaped, as the authors put it. As you look at this, this is even more dramatic than what you do see in some sauropods, namely Barosaurus. So yeah, that seems like it's at least some sort of new taxa. Maybe it's a theropod, maybe it's not, but it could be, because it's not like anything else we've seen. There's also other bones, though, including some limb bones, so we can look at the humerus. And what's really interesting is they have a very large delta pectoral crest, something that we do see in Allosaurus. And honestly, Allosaurus humeri seem pretty similar between the two species, so maybe it's just an Allosaurus. The few femora that have been found are also pretty similar, femora being the upper leg bone. When we do even just basic outlines, you can see they line up pretty well, with the blue ones here being for the Kenton Quarry, and the red being Allosaurus specimens from outside of the Kenton Quarry. There's also the tibia and fibula preserved, which the tibia isn't super useful. It has a really large crest on it for attaching muscles, but again, that's not distinct from some of the other species in the Morrison Formation. The fibula, though, has these three shallow fossae for muscle attachments, and that is unique within the Morrison Formation. So, probably from something new. Although one of these is really shallow, which is similar to another animal that I'll get to in a moment. However, first we need to look at one last bone, the post-orbital bone. Oh, hey, right here. Here's the post-orbital bone, <laughs> right here. It's the post-orbital bone is this kind of rock hammer shaped bone just behind the eye socket, thus post-orbital. However, really importantly, in other species of Allosaurus, it's really rugose up at the top of it, meaning it's, you know, got dents and wrinkles in it for some sort of texturing. The post-orbital bone of the Kenton Quarry Theropod is very similarly shaped to these Allosaurus post-orbitals, but it's smooth. It doesn't have that rugosity near the top of it. Combined with that fibula that I was hinting at earlier, having a very, very shallow fossae at the very top of it, something we see in Allosaurus Jim Mads and I, it seems like the Kenton Quarry Theropod is actually a species of Allosaurus. And some people I'm sure are going to be upset about that, however they did at least make an homage to Saurophaganax, because it's Allosaurus anax. Which again, king, it's kind of like Rex putting that at the end of it. So the king of the Allosauruses, essentially. With some of the bones that they had, namely the metatarsals, so some of the foot bones, they were able to do thin sectioning. So you cut off a little piece of the bone, put it on some epoxy, and then grind it really thin so you can get light shining through it. From that, they were able to see some of the structures at the outside of the bone called an EFS, which just means it's starting to form these really distinct lines that mean the growth rate. From this, they were able to find evidence of slower growth rate near the outside of the bone. Essentially, it's reaching full maturity, so it doesn't need to keep adding these distinct layers onto the bone. That's this kind of very laminar area on the outside of it. They were also able to measure some of the limb bones to try and understand how heavy the animal would have been. 
And what they found is, yeah, it makes sense to call it the King of the Allosaurus, mostly because it would have weighed at least one ton more than the largest known Allosaurus specimen, which is quite a bit. You're basically jumping from two tons all the way up to three tons. And that's just with the smallest individual in the quarry. Based on the bones that have been found, the largest individual would have been even larger, pushing 4.5 tons. So when you're considering what's going on in the Morrison Formation with all of these theropods, Allosaurus was the first one found and often considered to be the king of it until Torvosaurus was found and seemed to be a little bit bigger. Well, it seems like at least for some of the time, Allosaurus Inax may have actually been the king of the Morrison Formation. But all of that is to say for what the hell is Saurophaganax, which I had had my patrons vote on and I was getting ready to write this and reached out to a friend who really likes Allosaurus, who told me to reach out to the author of this paper. Saurophaganax is nothing. It does not exist. It's a chimera of more than one sauropod species, maybe three. Although, who knows? Maybe it could come back. Additionally, with that one vertebra that's still kind of indeterminate, if we can find that vertebra attached to a whole bunch of a bigger skeleton that is a theropod, then Saurophaganax lives. We can actually use that name still. It's just a matter of finding a vertebra with those same structures alongside an entire skeleton. So, a pretty rare find. So the answer for what is Saurophaganax? It's a lot of things. It's a Camarasaur, it's a Apatosaur, and it's an Allosaurus. And hopefully with some more finds, we can find out if it's its own thing or not. But that's part of paleontology, is figuring out what you have from pieces of incomplete animals.